Good morning, Living Stones Church. This is week two of our current teaching series based on the series You in Five Years by Pastor Levi Lusko. We are just asking two simple questions. Who will we be five years from now if we continue on our present course? And who do we want to be five years from now? Where is our momentum taking us? And do we like that destination? Because now is the time to get off the train if we don't like where it's going. This week's session is called In the Absence of a Crisis. Who will you be in 2024? And who do you want to be by the time the next half decade is over? We're giving some thought to that now. Instead of the usual New Year's resolution of 12 months, which often seems not enough time to accomplish what we want to do. We are asking, what do I want to accomplish 60 months from now that in 12 months would have been left unfinished or partially achieved? In 1 Kings 19, we find the first of three passages we're going to consider today. It's about the man, Elisha, who would eventually become a prophet because Elijah, one of the Bible's greatest prophets, invited him to take drastic action to change his life. Elijah is a fiery figure who, alongside Moses, really represents the office of a prophet. You have in Elijah this hard-to-fill set of shoes, but God told Elijah in advance who was going to replace him. He said, it's going to be Elisha. I'm reading excerpts from 1 Kings chapter 19. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat from Abel Meloah to succeed you as prophet. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them, and he burned the ploughing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and to become his servant. Let's have a look at this a little more closely. So Elijah departed from the cave where he had been hiding to avoid the wrath of Jezebel in the previous chapter and was directed by God to go to the desert of Damascus and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, his successor. When Elijah found Elisha, he was ploughing with 12 yoke of oxen. Now, you didn't respond with a gasp, but you really should have, because this was an indication of just how enormously wealthy Elisha is. You see, an ox in that day would be the equivalent of an expensive John Deere or Massey Ferguson tractor, or a costly combine harvester, or any other top-of-the-range farm equipment that you can think of. Goodness, and Elisha had 12 pairs of them. That means he had 24 items of really expensive farming equipment. Now consider this, how vast do your land holdings have to be to need to necessitate owning 24 of them? That would have to be one big property. And Elisha had two dozen. That would mean that Shaphat and Son, or more appropriately, Shaphat Farming Incorporated, was a considerable enterprise. Elisha is obviously the Howard Buffet of his time, CEO of Shaphat Farming Incorporated and waiting to take over as chairman of the board one day. It's a huge responsibility, it's a massive calling. And perhaps he was thinking that him in five years would be chairman of the board and having 48 yoke of oxen. And yet, it was not what God had planned for him. The text continues. Then Elijah passed him and threw his mantle on him. That might seem a very unusual thing to do. Had they even ever met before? Or shall he be startled? It would seem from the verses not. 
Even if they had never met, Alicia would have certainly known who Elijah was. He was a larger-than-life character, the mightiest of the miracle-working prophets. But the action unfolded with such apparent speed, it would have been difficult to, to know exactly what was going on in the mind of Alicia. One moment he's ploughing, the next moment he's wearing a celebrity's cloak. You have to understand it was a symbolic gesture. For the Star Wars fans amongst us, it was almost like Obi-Wan Kenobi handing a lightsaber to Luke Skywalker and saying, let's go. This was an unpaid internship that Elijah was offering him, but it was a chance to be under his authority. He was ultimately saying, one day, if you follow me and learn from me, be my disciple and be my pupil, you too could be part of the Jedi. And Elisha knew full well what was being offered to him. And that's why the text in verse 20 says, he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. He would, of course, hand it back the cloak. He realised doesn't, he doesn't receive it yet. He has to earn it. He understands it was just a ceremony. It was just symbolism. But he's excited by the opportunity on offer. He said, please let me kiss my father and mother and then I will follow you. Perhaps now we have a better understanding of what Elisha was walking away from. He was walking away from Shafat Farming Incorporated. He's walking away from chairman of the board. This is literally kissing the life he knew, the life he loved, the future that was before him goodbye. He was saying goodbye to all of that to follow Elijah, whose life, though impressive, was also, was also treacherous as almost all lives are that are greatly used by God. Elijah was a great prophet and he was famous. He called down fire from heaven and he said, it's not going to rain until I say it will. But in between, there were many years lived in extreme hardship. Now Elisha knows full well, that's what he is embracing. A life where God is going to use him dramatically. But hardship and difficulty and opposition and absolutely simply not knowing from day to day what's going to happen. And that's just what he accepted here on the spot. Elijah responds and says, go back again for what have I done to you? In other words, yes, kiss them, but just make sure you think twice about what you're doing here before you sever your ties. Make sure you count the cost before you deny yourself. Pick up your cross and choose to follow me, using the language of the New Testament. Make sure you understand exactly the new life you have chosen. Make sure you understand that you're embracing sacrifice. You're embracing a life where you're not in control once you choose to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord. Make sure you understand that full well. Make sure you fully understand what's going to happen what you are giving up before committing. Elisha turned back from him, said goodbye to his parents, and then he took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and chose to follow Elisha and he became his servant. In answer to Elijah's question, do you really mean it? Do you understand what's really happening here? He turned around and killed these animals and made a bonfire and cooked and shared the meat from the oxen he once, just a moment before, was driving. And all that had represented his life to follow Elijah. Sometimes that's what we have to do too. So he follows Elijah and what does he do? Well, the text told us he became his servant. He became his servant for many years. Some scholars say six, others say 15. But what is clear, it's a very long time. And he might have been thinking that the me in five years plan wasn't going exactly as anticipated. During this time, however long it was, we received just one detail of the internship and what it involved. 2 Kings 3 verse 11 says, but Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. 
he used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. He poured water on the hands of Elijah. Waiting for the next verse? No, that's it. That's all the detail we get for the years as Elijah's servant. He poured water on the hands of his master. His function was that of the one who effectively provided the hand sanitizer. How many times during those years did he think back to how life on Shaphat Farming Incorporated and cringe at the notion that he felt years of obscurity, years as a servant, years and all he did was pour water on the hands of Elijah. We don't hear of a stir stirring sermon. There's no wonderful miracle. He was merely in the background, a supportive role in the ministry that made Elijah do what he needed to do. And that's the second movement of the story, the importance of small acts of service and patience. And now on to the third. Elijah's time on earth is coming to an end. Elijah, <coughs> Elisha would not leave him, so they travelled in the company of the prophets from Bethel, then Jericho, and then on to the Jordan. Reading excerpts from 2 Kings chapter 2. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left and the two of them crossed over dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elisha said. Yet, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. And Elisha then picked up Elijah's coat that had fallen from him and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck it with the water. Now the Lord, where is now the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left and he crossed over. The company of prophets from Jericho who were watching said, the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha and they went to meet him and they bowed to the ground before him. Finally, the details are revealed a little as Elijah's life was nearing its conclusion. God told Elijah in advance he was about to go to heaven. His time on earth had come to its conclusion. He let Elisha know that Elijah's end was near. They began walking to a solitary place where Elijah was going to go to heaven, but they had to cross a river first. Elijah stopped at the river's edge. Elisha, from all his years in service, knew better than to ask any questions. He just assumed if Elisha stopped, there was a good reason to it. Early on in his servitude, he might have suggested a means of crossing, but I'm sure as time went on, and the more he just learned to speak when spoken to, when he was asked a good question, come up with the best answer he could, and just silently learn from his master. I'm sure that that wisdom paid off as when they arrived at the edge of the river, Elijah looked at it, took off his mantle, the same one he had put on, Elisha, and struck the edge of the river with it. The river divided in two and they crossed over onto dry land. For this moment in the story, we move on to verse 9. And so it was when they crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, 
ask what I may do for you before I'm taken away from you. And Elisha said, please, a double portion of your spirit be upon me. I love that request. And let's hope that's what's in your spirit. I hope if you think of the great things that God has done in other people's lives and in the world and in your life, I hope your request facing the future is, God, do twice as much in the coming days. I hope that's what you're praying over your children, your grandchildren, your church. I hope that you're saying, God, I'd like a double portion in the coming days. I want to see you do even more. And far from being offended, that's God's heart all along. Finally, he can see how our faith has grown. He wants to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ever ask, think or imagine. The problem with praying small prayers is that you might just get what you've asked for instead of what God wanted you to have all along. So Elijah considers what Elisha asked for. He is the mightiest of the miracle working prophets. We know in his entire life that he, it's recorded that he performed 14 different miracles. You've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if, if not, it shall not be so. The text continues. Then it happened as they continued and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. No dying peacefully in his sleep, a fiery chariot and a whirlwind. This is such a dramatically fantastic day that you couldn't even make it up. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. Why? It was out of respect, out of grief, to show honour that he loved Elijah and would miss him until his own day came to go to heaven, though probably not as spectacularly. He took up the mantle that had fallen from him and he went back and stood by the bank of the river Jordan. He hit the river with the mantle and look what happened. All those years in waiting as Elisha the servant, his time had come. He took it up, he struck the water and he said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, it divided this way and that. And Elisha, the prophet, crossed over.